welcome. You're about to listen to an encouraging, life-changing message presented at Joy Christian Center, Basildon. Today, as Pastor David mentioned, we are going to talk about evangelism because this month we are stressing evangelism. Evangelism has become a, 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 a taboo word in the church. Most people don't want to hear, like you saw in the play, most people don't want to hear the word evangelism. It's almost like the F word. We don't, we don't want to hear it. When we talk about evangelism, ah, Pastor, me, I can't preach you. Pastor, me, I'm shy. Oh, Pastor, me, I don't know the Bible. Uh, ah, Pastor, you know, if I'm going to evangelize, I have to go to Bible school. You don't have to do any of those things. And we'll find out today. Amen. So we have already established the fact that evangelism or evangelizing the world was Christ's last command and it should be our responsibility as followers of Christ. Today I want to look at evangelism as a lifestyle. Now we all have a lifestyle so we know what it is. Amen. Is there anybody here, is there anybody who doesn't know what a lifestyle is? No. No. Not one. So, so I'm not going to uh, you know, try and define a lifestyle because I don't want to spend too much time on that. But one person may choose to have a healthy lifestyle, which means that that person has chosen to eat healthy and exercise regularly. Another person you know, can also choose to live a simple lifestyle. You know, and when somebody is living a simple lifestyle, their motto is often uh, no funny clothes, no expensive gadgets or cars, just the bare necessities of life. So we have different lifestyles that we choose to live from time to time. In fact, sometimes we even change lifestyles depending on the environment the area we find ourselves in, sometimes certain circumstances may force you to readapt your lifestyle. For example, most of us had a certain lifestyle in Africa. And then when we moved into this country, we had to change our lifestyle because the environment was different. For example, I don't think any of you wore snow boots in Africa. You don't need it. I don't think any of us wore bumper jackets in Africa, although some people do. These days, the fashion there is that people wear leather jacket and leather trousers, you know, because it's fashion. And, and I, I don't know. But normally, we don't wear those things. That's not the lifestyle there. We tend to wear light clothes and, you know, something simple so that uh, we can have a lot of air because it's a very hot climate. But when you move here, you were forced to adapt to the lifestyle here. In fact, you have even acclimatized to the degree that you've learned to eat certain foods now. You know, I never knew anything about potatoes and gravy. When I was, right? When I was in Africa, we don't do potatoes and gravy. You know, we do the kind of food that you eat in the morning, you know, and uh, it's enough to keep you going till you come back at night. And then when you come, you come and seal the deal with something heavy again. That makes you snore throughout. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's changed now. Um, and so we can see that even by relocating to a different environment, our lifestyle, the new environment demanded that we make a change in our lifestyle. And even today, some of us have come to this point where even our age is demanding that we make a change in our lifestyle. Amen? Amen. Okay, because some of you have gotten to that point uh, in your age where your belly is beginning to tell you, I need some exercise. Your, your body weight is saying, uh-uh. And in fact, your wardrobe is even testified to that fact. Because you look in your wardrobe and you realize that some of your clothing have shrunk, seriously shrunk, all right? And, and, and that is telling you that a change in lifestyle 
is required. Okay. So please let's be aware that whatever lifestyle we choose to live, it is an advertisement, number one, of who you are, and it is an advertisement of your values in life. If you have a healthy lifestyle, it advertises who you are. It will show on your body. Amen. It will even show in the choices that you make when it comes to food and so on and so forth. There are those who will spend lots of money on the gym and so on and so forth because it's, your, it's become your lifestyle. It has even become part of your value. It's become part of your daily routine. So that's the kind of lifestyle we are talking about, and that's the way evangelism should be to us. And so when we say that we are making evangelism our lifestyle, we are talking about being able to advertise who we are in Christ and our values, how we value the commands of Jesus Christ and how we are endeavoring to live out that value in our day and age. Amen. And, and to start, I think it is important for us to look at Jesus himself. How did Jesus do this? Did he evangelize? I think he did. He did it, and he did it beautifully. Hallelujah. So if you have your Bibles, please, go to uh, Mark chapter 6. I'm going to, I'm not going to take too much time at all. It's going to be a long day for me today, but the Lord is good. Mark chapter 6, from verse 7. Jesus used different ways and different methods to reach out to people. And we are going to look at some of them. In Mark chapter 6, verse 7 to 13, Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. Amen. Amen. Two by two. He sent out his, his disciples. Now, that is what we today in the church have adopted as program. That sometimes we send people out, maybe on Saturday, or on a day that we know that our locality, in our locality, people will be at home. So we send people out. Two by two. And it's a good thing because Christ himself did that. So let's look at Mark chapter 6, verse 7. I'm sure you are there. Okay, I'm going to read it quickly. And he calls the twelve to himself and began to say to them, and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a, uh, except a staff. No bag, no bread, no copper, that is money, in their money belts, but to wear sandals, and not to put on two tunics. Don't even take two clothes. Also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Amen. So, one of the ways Christ did evangelism was that he sent people out two by two. It is always good to send people in pairs. You know, Jehovah Witnesses even come in pairs. All right? And what I've noticed is that anytime they come in pairs, most of the time, if you look at them carefully, you will find out. Most of the time, one of them is a learner. They are training the person on the job. So whenever I get excited and I want to engage them, I, I address the, the one who is not talking. Okay? Not the one who is asking the questions and saying, or the one who is very quiet. That's the one I speak to. And I did that some time ago, and she, she looked at me and looked at her boss and said, I'm so confused. I said, listen to me. Don't listen to him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, so 
we send them out two by two, and that's good when you go with someone else. But in John chapter 3 and chapter 4, Jesus used another strategy. Jesus did what I will call personal or lifestyle evangelism. In John chapter 3, verse 1 to 9, here is the point. Nicodemus, who the Bible said was a ruler of the Jews, was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. That means this man knows the law of Moses. He understands some things about their religious culture and background and everything else that the law teaches. Nicodemus was a champion in his own right. But the Bible says that the same man came to Jesus at night. He came to Jesus with many questions. And why did he come to Jesus? He came to Jesus because obviously Nicodemus must have heard the miracles or probably even saw some of the miracles that Jesus did and it raised questions in his mind so he came to Jesus to ask him questions and some of the questions he asked him is that look I know you are a teacher from God for no man can do these things except the Lord is with him so that's Nicodemus's testimony and evidence of the fact that he had seen all the miracles and his head about all the things that Christ is doing. And so in his mind, he was saying, surely, this guy is not like any of us. This is maybe the, 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 the Messiah from God. So he went to him by night, secretly, to ask him questions. And Jesus seized the opportunity to tell Nicodemus about salvation. For in John chapter 3, verse 3, he said, for I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can this be? Can a, mother, a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, I'm not talking about physical birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. So in verse 5, Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In that passage alone, Jesus revealed that there is what we call the seeing or the perceiving of the kingdom, and there is also the entering of that kingdom. In other words, you can perceive the kingdom, but it may not be your experience until you enter it. Amen. Amen. And so maybe Nicodemus knew something about the kingdom, but he, has not, he had not perceived the kingdom, neither had he entered the kingdom so he could not experience what Jesus was talking about and Jesus explained it to him. So Jesus, uh, Jesus allowed people to come to him and he spoke to them about the kingdom. In John chapter 4, we also saw that Jesus Christ was traveling with his disciples and the Bible said that he needed to go through Samaria. Now, Samaria in the time of Christ, uh, was a, a no-go area for Jews because the two don't see eye to eye. But Jesus intentionally went through Samaria. Samaria was not a shortcut. He could have chosen a shortcut. But he purposely said to his disciples, let's go through Samaria. And as he entered Samaria, the Bible said he was weary, he was tired. And hungry, wanted some things to eat. So the disciples said, okay. They got to a well, and they said, Lord, sit here. Let us go and buy some food from town, and we'll come. I'm sure when they left, Jesus must have said hallelujah. So they went to town to go and get some food. And while Jesus was sitting by the well, the Bible said that, lo, a woman from the city came to the well to draw water. And as soon as she got to the well, Jesus said, can I have some water to drink, please? Then the woman said, how dare you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan, for water? Don't you know that Samaritans have nothing to do with Jews? And Jesus said, if you know the one who is talking to you, you would rather ask me of water, and I will give you living water. Then the woman said, ooh, interesting. By the way, where are you going to get that living water? Because the well is deep, and as I can see, you have nothing to draw the water. I'm the one who's got everything to draw the water. Where are you going to get it from? 
And then Jesus said, uh, then the woman said, well, so if you have this uh, living water, then why don't you give me so that I stop coming here? I like that conversation. And Jesus said, okay, I'll give you the uh, living water, but why don't you go and call your husband? Then the lady said, I have no husband. Jesus said, hmm, I think you have spoken truly because you've had five husbands. And the one you are living with, husband number six, is not your husband. So you have spoken the truth. Then the woman said, I know that uh, Messiah is to come one day and he will talk to us about uh, our sins and sins. And Jesus, for the very first time ever in his ministry, revealed his identity to this woman. He said, I who speak to you, I am he. Then the Bible records that immediately the woman left everything. She forgot about the water, ran into town, and, and reading it today, I noticed something. The Bible said that she went and told the man. <laughs> I'll let that sink in. She went and told the man, come and see a man who is telling me about everything I have ever done. Come and see. The woman went and told the man. Maybe the man included the five who had already been with her and broken her heart and divorced her because she had met the seventh man, Jesus transformation had taken place and so now she had the grace, the gut and the confidence to go and talk to the men and say to them come and see a man who is not like you. He told me everything I have ever done. In that statement too I believe there is couched in there this man didn't judge me for my past. This man didn't reject me for my past. This man accepts me. My race as a Samaritan makes no difference to him, a Jew. This is certainly the Messiah. Come and see. So with this story too, we can see the two stories. John chapter 3, Jesus and Nicodemus. John chapter 4, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. You can see the two strategies. Nicodemus, he came to him. Samaritan woman, Jesus went there. So sometimes when it comes to evangelism, we can allow people to come to us. Or we go to them. Both are legitimate. Amen. Amen. You say, how can people come to us? Oh, they come to you all the time. You know, your birthdays, when you put those chicken and stuff on the fire and you start burning them. I, ha I have discovered something. I don't know about any other country, but I, I, I know that, you know, Ghanaians, for some reason, like to invite themselves to parties that they have not been invited to. I think it's called gate crashing. <laughs> All right? Any, any, anybody experienced that from Nigeria, other countries? Okay. I know English people don't do that. English people, you have to invite them and give them time. Okay? And when an English person, you have invited them for dinner or something like that, they'll bring their own wine. All right? They, they'll bring something, by all means. <laughs> We, 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 bring, we bring nothing. Our stomach is enough. All right? And, and I kind of like that. They'll bring wine. They'll, you know, they'll bring something. You know, chocolate, something. They'll bring something to the dinner. If you invite a white person, try it. They'll, bring, they'll always bring something. Come for dinner. They'll bring something. They, they will bring wine or drink or something, chocolate or something. They will always bring something. But when you invite your bro, chances are they'll come very late and they'll bring nothing. 
And if God help you and that day is a Saturday, man, they'll come late and trust me, they're going to stay well into the night because they have to eat breakfast, lunch, supper, plus all the extras. If God does not intervene, they will even take, take our way home <laughs> for Monday. I know what I'm talking about because I've been there before. But we are talking about personal evangelism. That you can use your personal celebrations and special occasions to allow people to come to you and use it as an opportunity to communicate the gospel, the good news to them. While sometimes you also take the time to actually go to people. Your workmates, you don't need to go to them because you all go to the same place. So, for example, in your workplace, all you have to do is to be a Christian. Somebody say, be a Christian. Be a Christian. Okay. You see, the Bible says in John chapter 1 that as many as received him, he gave them power, verse 12, to become the sons and daughters of God. So, Becoming a child of God is a divine thing that God does in you. He gives you the power, the right, or the ability to become. You see, but when you try to do Christianity without allowing God to help you to become, you upset people. Oh, oh, I think this is good. I have to repeat that. Have you met one of those people who are trying to do Christianity? When they come to work, praising the Lord always, praising the Lord always, yeah. And, and then they, uh, uh, I have a God who never fails. I have a God who never fails. I have a God who never fails. And the unbeliever is sitting there thinking, who is she talking to? You're putting them off. No, just be yourself. Let them know you are human. You make mistakes just like them. Okay? Blood flows through you just like them. The only difference is that you know somebody called Jesus that you can take all your worries, your hurt, and your pain too. And he makes all the difference in your life. So you become a good advertisement for Christ by loving your neighbor and showing them that with all your imperfections, you still care. Because sometimes people see us Christians as though we are perfect. But I'm sure you know, just as I know, and I discover that every day, that I'm not perfect. Amen. You see, this hole in front of our face would even tell you that you're not perfect. All you need to do is open it. And imperfections flow out. Even what I'm saying here today, I probably said something that somebody is upset right now. Who does he think he is? We are not perfect. So you don't hide your imperfection. Neither do you gloat about your imperfection. But just be human. Amen. Just be human. That way, people can come to you. Notice when Jesus was talking to this woman at the well of Jacob, he never said to her that, you know, um, I'm going to die on the cross for you, so uh, you need to put your life. No, 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 no. All he said was, the woman said, I know Messiah is coming. And Jesus said, I'm the one. That's it. Jesus could have used the opportunity to start the first church of the Samaritans International Incorporated and make this woman the head pastor. No, no, because she went out and told the men that come and see a man who tells me everything that I've ever done. But Jesus gave her the good news. Oh, there's so much I can share from that passage. A woman who's had five husbands. My goodness, and she's with number six. And number six was a borrowed husband. Mm. And Jesus was man number seven. Hallelujah. You know seven represents what? Perfection. So when she met Jesus, Jesus is saying that, okay, all the trial lock marriages you've had, it ends here. Because I who speak to you, I am the Messiah, the Savior. 
It's over. Transformation has come. And this woman became an evangelist. She simply went out and told the men. Probably she felt more comfortable relating to the men because she's been with them. Some of us become born again and the very thing, the first thing we do is we want to forget about our past and cut off everybody we used to relate with. No, no. You have to go there as the light to be an advertisement for Jesus Christ that I used to be like one of you, but now look at me, I'm changed. Be a testimony to them. And that's what this woman did. She went to town and told the men. I'm sure at least three of the five men, you know, must have heard. Wow. You, ah. And, and if I, when you read on later, when the men came to Jesus, you know what they said? They said to the lady, <laughs> you told us to come and see this man. Now that we have seen him, we believe him. You go away. Yeah. I like that. When the men came, they, they held on to Christ and they said, now we don't believe because of what you said. We believe because we have seen him. Mm. <laughs> I, can, can you hear what I'm saying? This is not about preaching church. We, we are talking about making the gospel very simple, and that's what I'm trying to do. Don't make it hard and fast rule. Or I have to know the scriptures. I have to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It, it's commendable. Please do if you can. But let it not be because you want to evangelize. The little that you know is enough. Because remember, it is not you who is going to do the conversion. It is not you who is going to do the conviction. It is the Holy Spirit in you who will do that work. You just be the vessel. Amen. Just be the vessel. You know, vessels don't uh, color the content or anything. They just carry it. If you put uh, uh, orange juice in a glass or a cup, okay, if the cup is blue, the orange juice won't turn blue. In fact, the orange juice will not become salty because of the cup. It's still orange juice. You can put it in another cup. It will just contain it for as long as you allow it to remain there. So you are like that vessel. You don't, you don't color the content. You just hold it. And at the right time, you release it. Hallelujah. Woo! You, you just release what's inside you. Your story can lead somebody to Christ. But we need to learn how to use our story to reach out to people. So Christ sent people two by two. He allowed others to come to them with questions while he also went Okay, even to places that you usually wouldn't want to go, but he went there because he cared. Can we take a leaf from Christ's strategy and from his book? Hallelujah. And Luke 19, verse 5 to 9 again. We, can, we don't have time to go there. Jesus also, and I like this. That's another strategy. Jesus also invited himself, okay, get crashing. Uh, I think even Jesus did that, so I let you off, all the Ghanaians. <laughs> now you have a scripture to support that. Because the Bible says Jesus was walking in town and there was a very short man. And by virtue of his height, he was at a disadvantage. Because all the tall people, where's Pastor David? All the tall people got in front of Zacchaeus. And, and uh, he tried, he, he, he tried, he pushed. No, 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 he couldn't help. Just too short. So this man devised an idea. The Bible said he went up a sycamore tree so he can actually get a better view over everybody. And by going up the tree, he didn't realize that that even put him on the spot. It exposed him. So Christ saw Zacchaeus on the tree and he said, Hey, buddy, calm down. All the tall people who were around didn't get that invitation. He said to Zacchaeus, Man, Come down. I must spend the day with you today. Come down. Hurry up. Then the Bible says Zacchaeus came down, took Jesus home, and Jesus had a meal with him. And as a result of the meal, they were talking, I'm sure. Then something happened to Zacchaeus. The Bible said that he said to Jesus, listen, everybody that I have cheated, he was a tax collector. 
Sometimes I charge my own VAT on taxes. But Jesus, now that I have met you, I am going to restore everything to everyone if I'm going to give them double what I took from them. That's called restitution. And that's a genuine sign of genuine repentance. He's had a change of heart. So he went and gave them whatever he stole from them. Who am I preaching to today? You, you, you know the... All the staplers and the office pins and the erasers and pencils that, and pens that you borrowed from your workplace, borrowed in coats. Mm-hmm. If you still have them, mm-hmm. let Zacchaeus speak to you. I had a story about a professor who had a son, and his son was misbehaving in school. So the teacher sent for this professor to come to the school so they can have a talk. And when they talked, they said to him, Professor, in fact, your son has been misbehaving. And uh, we have noticed that lately, your son has started stealing. He keep on taking pen, pencils, and paper, and stuff like that from the school cupboard. And the professor said, why did he have to do that? All he need to do is to ask me. I will bring him some from work. <laughs> you didn't get it. I'm praying for you. <laughs> He said, he doesn't need to do that. All he needs to do is to ask me. I will bring him pen, pencil, and paper from work. No wonder. That's where the boy got it from. Because daddy brings them from work. So, in closing, why, what was Jesus' secret of success? I think Jesus was very successful at evangelism. Personal evangelism, corporate evangelism, anything he tried in the form of Preaching the good news, he was successful. Now the question was, what was his secret of success? Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, let's look at it. Verse 35. As I get ready to close. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. I think it's there. Are you there? Mark 135. Okay. Now in the morning... Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now, this, is, this, this should help, you know, those who like to pray in bed during winter, okay? You, you remember, you cover yourself with a duvet. Come on, am I talking to some people here? It's very cold, so you cover yourself. Say, I'm going to pray in bed. Shanakaya <laughs> makasu. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a verse here for you. It says, now in the morning, having risen long before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. So get out of bed. <laughs> Amen. Leave the duvet and go to a quiet place. Get out. You get it? Because Jesus himself did it. All right. So not only have we found a scripture for gate crashing parties, we found another verse that will help us get out of bed and pray. But the point the Bible is making here is that Jesus got up very early, even before daybreak, and he prayed. He committed his day into the hands of God. It has, I believe we can pray at any time, but I'm a firm um, advocate of praying first thing in the morning because I've experimented with this. That days that I'm not able to pray in the morning, in fact, somebody will say that is just in your head. It's not in my head. I know that for a fact. I checked, the last time I checked that, I've been born again now for 30 years. Okay? So I'm almost a vest veteran born again Christian. 30 years is a long time. I know I don't look 30 But I've been born again for 30 years. And, and I've tried this several times. And, and I think, that's just my opinion, praying in the morning is great. Because one, it gives you the opportunity to commit, commit your day to the hands of God. 
It gives you the opportunity to also pray that God will give you opportunity to communicate the gospel during the day. Amen? And, and it prepares you mentally, emotionally, and everything for the day. So that you start your day on a very positive note, smiling, you know, and ready for anything. The day that you miss that, you are grumpy. You become Miss Grumpy and Mr. Grumpy all the time. Somebody say, good morning. What is good about this morning? You didn't pray, that's why. But when you pray in the morning, you say, good, hello, fine morning. <laughs> you see, there's a difference. So Jesus woke up and prayed, and I believe this was the secret of the success of the personal evangelism that Christ did. He, he woke up early in the morning, and then what? He prayed. I want to give you three points here. So Jesus prayed every morning before daylight. You know that already. And then he also sees, from the passages we've looked at so far, Jesus seized every opportunity to share the good news. So people came to him uh, with questions. We, we didn't know the full question that Nicodemus had, but all we knew was that Christ preached the good news to him, that you must be born again. That's it. Amen. And all around us, there are people with questions. There are people who have questions, and that's always a great opportunity for us. In our door-to-door -door, um, activities this past week, we've encountered people in the community who, who were saying all kinds of things and asking all kinds of things. It will amaze you. Church, there's a huge need out there. When we did the same thing last year, you know, right at the back of this school. There's this place there where they were telling us, you know, we need people to come and help us with the youth. We don't know what to do with the youth. This year, they're saying the same thing again. The youth, the youth, the youth. Right around uh, Pensimid, opposite this school, that's where we are doing this year. Y you know, there is the news, I think it was even in the newspapers, that uh, a man was just relaxing in his car, you know, dozing off. And some youth went and set the car on fire with flare. And the, man, the car burned the man to death. Right here. You remember there was a Sunday we were coming to church and we saw police people have called in the place. That was it. You know, another youth stabbed somebody. He cut his stomach around Iceland. Cut his stomach open. And that young guy, I understand, is friends with some of our youth here. But that guy who cut the person now is looking at 24 years in prison. He's 19, and he's going to prison for 24 years for killing somebody. You know, and as a church, we have the answer, we have the solution. We, need, we don't just need to pray for them, but we need to devise a plan as to how we are going to reach out to this youth, because trust me, the council haven't got a clue. They don't know what to do. They just don't know what to do. Some years back, we kept ask, asking the council, you know, uh, where are the homeless? And they told us there are no homeless people in Basildon. No, that's what Basildon Council said. We, there, are no homeless, oh, we don't, there are no homeless people. But we've held several meals and homeless people have showed up. So they probably came from Kent, right? No, no, no. This is, this is a job for us. It's waiting for us to meet that need. Because through that, we can preach the gospel to them. So Christ seized every opportunity to present the gospel. Number three, Jesus, see, Jesus saw opportunity when people, um, Jesus allowed people to come to him, and he also went to people. So sometimes when people come to you, you listen to them, help them, but in the process, share Christ with them. If they are already Christians, encourage them. But if they are not born again, Give them the gospel. Okay? So how can we make evangelism our lifestyle? We can make evangelism our lifestyle by doing what Peter suggested in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3 verse 15. Let's look at what the Bible says. This is the word of God. We have to remember to turn on this air condition sometime. It's all part of the rent we pay here, right? First Peter, chapter 3, 
and verse 15. This is a very powerful scripture. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. Other translations will say to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, okay? For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. But my, my, my emphasis is in verse 15, where it says that always be what? Talk to me, church. Always be... Uh -huh. You see, you're in that place again because I'm talking about evangelism and you're very quiet. If I was talking about the 77 steps to Abraham's blessing, you see people jumping, yes, amen. This is the one you should be saying amen to. The Bible says that always be ready, be alert all the time. Amen. What does it mean? Study, read, listen to the news. Amen. This, uh, you know, catastrophe in France can be a very good opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. Amen. When they come talking to you about, oh, how sad, he killed 84 people. I said, yes, can you imagine if these people, 84 people, don't know Christ? Opportunity. Amen. To share Christ with somebody and encourage them and tell them, look, it's not about those who died in France. It's about you. If you die today, where are you going? We pray and we mourn with those who have died in France, but, but you, today, do you know Jesus? Uh, do you have eternal security? If you die today, where, where are you going to spend eternity? And let's minister to them. So the Bible says we should always be ready. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. It means set Christ apart in your heart. How do you set Christ apart in your heart? Be a Christian. Amen. Be a Christian. Now, now. To be a Christian goes more than Sunday. Can somebody say amen? amen? Okay, I have preached now. Being a Christian goes beyond Sunday. Can I get an amen? amen? All right. Being a Christian goes beyond Wednesday. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, be a, being a Christian should cover Monday, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday morning, right up to Saturday evening, even Saturday midnight. You, you are a Christian. You don't get to take it off. Christian through and through. So when you are upset, be upset as a Christian. And say, I'm really, really angry. If not for Christ's sake, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is just constraining me to love you instead of punching you. Because I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. We be Christian all the time, 24-7. Hallelujah. Eh? Be a Christian. It goes beyond Sunday. There are times that I, I, I would that Christians will not carry physical Bible. They will just carry it in their heart. That's more powerful. You see, because when you carry the Bible in your heart, it means you have internalized it. It means it is your experience now. It's not just head knowledge. It's your experience. You see, when you talk to me about certain stuff, I'm not going to refer to my Bible. Why? Because... I am making it my experience anyway. So I can talk to you without looking into the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? I am not saying the Bible is not important. I'm saying it's so important that I'm taking it in. And I want to make it my experience every time. The Word of God. I've heard sisters in this church say, Pastor, I met a friend of mine, and she's got this problem, and I said, uh, do you want to talk to my pastor? Hey, I wasn't there. Why are you creating trouble for me? No, you were there. No, you met the person. You talked to the person. If my pastor were here, oh, you know, my pastor, hey, he can preach. Oh, I know. No, no, it's your opportunity to preach to that person. So you talk to them. Don't make it my business. Make it your business because they are telling you. It's because somehow they've seen something in you, they feel they can trust you. That is why they are telling you. They are not telling you because they want you to direct them to Pastor William. No, only bring them to me when you get to the difficult part. For example, when they say that the devil is chasing after them and you think you can't handle that big devil, you bring them this way. Amen? 
and we'll do everything to step on that devil's tail in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why you need to be ready all the time. Be ready. In other words, be alert. As somebody is speaking to you, you are listening, looking for an opportunity, you know, a clue to share the gospel. Don't just listen to them. Because most of the time, the way Christians listen is that we listen to people and just to wait, waiting for them to finish talking so we can also tell them. So they are telling you how bad and how rough things are. And you say, hmm, my sister, if I want to tell you what I have been through, what a missed opportunity. They are not inviting you to, te to tell them your problem. They don't want to know. Tell them how Jesus, see, and the reason why we like to tell people our problem is because we don't take our problem to Christ. We carry it around. Pastor has prayed for you. I poured olive oil on your head. The only thing I've not done is lay my legs on you. And, and you're still carrying the problem around. <laughs> it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. It hurts. Take it to Jesus. Because sometimes pastor too has problems. Amen. You know when you come, I'll still pray for you. And then after you are gone, I'm going to talk to God. I say, hey, buddy, what you just did for her, remember me. Mm -hmm. We have to do that. So when they come to you, talk to them because we have opportunities every day. So three things we need to do. Christ, I, I've shown you three things from Christ's life. Let's look at three things we need to do in preparing ourselves to share the gospel. Number one, like Jesus, pray every day for the opportunity to share the good news. Always pray. Ask God to give you an opportunity. Regardless of what you do as a person, your work, whatever, pray for the opportunity to share Christ with somebody. I'll never forget one morning. We're going to go out and uh, spend time with the children. We prayed. And as I was praying, I don't know why I prayed that, but I said, Lord, I pray that today you will bring somebody into our life that we can help. And God answered that prayer like five minutes after we prayed. Five minutes. Maximum ten. Because we got to the office around PC Market. As soon as I was pulling my car into park, I saw this neighbor of ours who's a Christian but married to a Muslim, so she's torn between the two faiths. And the police people have stopped her. Apparently, there was something, either MOT or something had gone off, or insurance. And so police had impounded her car. And she was there with her two kids and stuff like that. And I happened to be on the spot when the police people were, were taking the uh, car seats and everything out of her car. So I sister, so and so, what's happening? The pastor will have it. <laughs> so helped her. I was thinking, wow, Lord, that was quick. So I helped her anyway, put everything to the car. I, I didn't know what was coming. Put everything to the car, and uh, I said, where are you going? I was going somewhere. But now, my agenda is on hold, because I prayed. So I picked her and took her and said, oh, Pastor, can I pick my children from this place? I said, yeah. That went. And I dropped my children. I said, you go. Go and do whatever I want to do. And then I dropped her and said, now, Pastor, uh, they say they are taking the car to this place. Uh, can, can you help me tomorrow? I was like, oh, I thought we were going to do this today. <laughs> he said, tomorrow. I said, sure. Tomorrow I'll come. Then the following day, I went there, took her all the way to somewhere behind Pips Hill, where they took the car. And we got there, I got to the counter, we were talking to her, and they said, where is this? I said, oh, I left it at home. <laughs> so I have to pick her again, back to the house, took everything, and, and now they said you have to pay X amount of money. And the pastor, all I have is this. <laughs> I said, uh, um, Okay. Uh. Hey, to be Jesus is not easy, you know. <laughs> it costs me time. It costs me money. But I think heaven rejoiced. 
and I had the opportunity to share things because one of the moments where I, I was dropping her somewhere, I said, Pastor, can I go to town center? I need to. I said, sure. And then she, she went buying incense. Said, Pastor, do you want to? I said, hey, this one. I said, this, this is evil. I said, oh, really? I just use it to, you know, it's better than air freshener. I said, no, go and get air freshener. This thing will invite demons to your house. And I opened the door again to share with her and to encourage her. Amen. Pray daily for God to give you. Now, some of you will not have opportunities like mine. I think because I'm a pastor, God gave me the big one. <laughs> Maybe you get a small one. Somebody depressed. Somebody's not happy. You know, somebody doesn't know something, what to do. Share it with them and encourage them. Okay? Help them first before you talk about come to church. Amen. So pray each day for the opportunity to share news. Number two, seize every opportunity. I'm sure you know this already. To do something good to remind people of Jesus. Seize every opportunity to do something good to remind people of Jesus. Amen. I was speaking to um, somebody on benefit some time ago. And uh, they are looking for, they want to move house. And I said to them, I'm going to pray for you that God will give you a four-bedroom house, but on one condition. When you get that four-bedroom house, you must come to church. So I prayed. I really, really prayed. I said, God, do it. Hey, I prayed. <laughs> I prayed. And guess what? After about two weeks or so, this guy came and he said, we've got the four bedrooms. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come to church. Yeah. You know what I thought? Maybe I should reverse my prayer. No, 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 no. Release them. At least I've sown a seed. Okay? He is probably going to be in two minds now. That this guy said he was going to pray. We got the four bedrooms. Oh, maybe it's the council. Uh, maybe it's his prayers. Maybe it's the council. I've sown a seed. Hallelujah. Seize every opportunity to do something good that will remind people of Jesus. Because that's who you are. Amen? Instead of uh, giving them the full length of your tongue, give them the short version. The gospel. I mean insulting. No. Give them the gospel. Number three and the last one. See opportunity when people visit you and when you visit people. You know those people you give them Johnny Walker, <laughs> Captain Morgan's rum. Oh, the other time I was in Lidl and, and uh, I tried to memorize a few names, but because it's not my thing, so I've forgotten. But <laughs> I have fun, you know. I, I look at some of the names of uh, alcohol. And I'm thinking, even the name itself <laughs> suggests that this thing is deadly, like Jack Daniels. <laughs> Think about it, Jack Daniels. It's a Jack. <laughs> Jack Daniels. Johnny Walker. <laughs> no wonder, you know, you can, uh, <laughs> John, Johnny, Johnny Walker. <laughs> and, and Lambrusco, that sounds like tongues. Lambrusco and Pink Lady. You know, instead of giving them that spirit, give them the spirit of the Lord. Amen. When people visit you, see opportunity to share Christ with them. Hallelujah. Tell them about maybe something that Jesus has done in the church. Tell them something Jesus has done in your life, in your family, and so on and so forth. That, hey, things are not perfect, but thank God it's not the way it used to be. So we are getting somewhere. Share. And, and, and also, when you visit people, look for an opportunity to preach to them. There's this uh, guy, very interesting guy, and I like the way he preaches the gospel. He just walked into a chemist, his local chemist, and, and you know these days how they, you go to a shop today and tomorrow you come back and everything is changed, they, they've rearranged the shop. And he walked, that, that's some sensitive to the spirit. He walked into this chemist and they've changed everything. So after he bought what he was buying, he went to the teller and said to the lady, do you see how this, everything has been rearranged in this shop? She said, oh, yes. 
said, that's exactly how Christ would change your life if you let him in. And he walked out. Wow. Powerful visual aid because the lady works there. She has seen the change. And now she's been given a visual picture that if you allow Christ to come into your life, that's how he's going to rearrange everything. So every moment we have opportunity, there is something around. And Jesus even did this. Jesus used everyday things to communicate the gospel to people. And that's all we have to do. You don't need to go to Bible school because it's all around you every day. Amen. Even if you have a flat tire and somebody is coming to help you, you can use that flat tire to preach to them. Amen. You can say to them, brother, I really thank you for helping me fix my flat tire, you know. I heard someone once says that, uh, you know, a bad attitude is like flatter. It gets you nowhere. Do you know Jesus? <laughs> Amen. We can use every opportunity to talk to people about Christ. Your party, a birthday party, your son's birthday party. Uh -huh. Invite your friends. Because when you tell them, come to church, they'll give you excuses. But when you tell them there's barbecue, if they live at hybridis, they'll come. Food is a very powerful thing. And so while they are eating, you talk to them. The Bible said in the book of Acts, they broke bread from house to house. It's not just the communion, it's food. And that's what we are learning to do in this church. We like to eat. True or false? Uh -huh. Now, we need to invite other people to come and share our meal with us. Let's talk to them about the love of Christ. You can do it. Turn to your neighbor and say to somebody, you can do it. Tell, to, tell somebody else, you can do it. Just be ready in your heart and be ready to seize every opportunity because evangelism is our lifestyle. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord.